What's up, everyone? Welcome back. Thank you all so much for joining us for another great video meetup today sponsored by Trusted Tech Team. Today, we're going to be talking all about Microsoft 365 and uh, what you should know about administrating a remote workforce. And for more on this, we have a great panel of experts for all today, including a couple of well-known and beloved faces from Trusted Tech Team. <laughs> things off with a round of introductions uh, so you can guys can meet our panel. Uh, coming to us first from Trusted Tech Team, uh, everyone please welcome back Mr. Chidera Do. Chidera, welcome back. Hey, how's it going today? How's it Always going? Have- yeah, it's going well, Justin. Thanks for having us. <laughs> for sure. Uh, Chidera, yeah. for those who've not had the pleasure of meeting you before, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself or what you do for Trusted Tech Team? Definitely. I do not mind at all. Uh, so over here, Trusted Tech Team. I am a Microsoft 365 Security and Compliance Solutions Architect. And uh, Trusted Tech Team as a whole, uh, we are a gold Microsoft partner uh, dealing heavily in the Microsoft Cloud Solution Provider space. And we're headquartered in Irvine, California. In addition to being a Microsoft Cloud Solutions Provider, uh, we also have um, a software, uh, or rather, we also are a software reseller, uh, which has really given us insight into the paradigm shift from traditional on-prem software deployments to cloud-hosted solutions and the problems that ensued. Right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Chidera. Looking forward to having you on. Uh, welcome your partner in crime. Uh, welcome <laughs> back, Mr. Michael Yu. Mike, welcome. Uh, hope you're doing well. How's it going? It's going great. I've uh, I've definitely missed being here. So uh, after a short <laughs> break, I'm back and I'm ready to do some more. Um, and yeah, uh, Chidera co- covered our company pretty well, but uh, Chidera uh, mainly deals with the security side and I focus more on the, the cloud and Azure side. So uh, yeah, uh, we work really well together and we make uh, quite a team here. <laughs> and we're uh, both happy to be here today. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us as well, Mike. Uh, Before we go any further, a couple of things I did want to point out to you guys. Uh, If you do have questions for uh, Michael or Chidera today, please make sure to get them into the Q&A widget down below. We'll be taking them later on. Um, Also, uh, we've got a ton of great resources from Trusted Tech, uh, so please make sure to check that out. Um, also, wanted to give a special shout out to chat and see a lot of folks that uh, we're excited to have in the show today, including Joel Kostelecki, uh, a little IT guy. Uh, I saw Eric Wojo in there as well. Hope you guys have all been staying safe and staying well. Of course, if you do decide to participate in chat, we ask that you adhere to our community guidelines. We want to make sure that everybody is having a positive and professional time in today's show today. And as a special thank you for hanging out with us today, one of y'all is going to be walking away with a $500 Amazon gift card. Um, Perfect just in time for summer. Uh, I'm sure that you guys are excited to get out there. Um, What's better than being outdoors and with some brand new cool stuff that goes along with it. So um, we'll be announcing the winner of that prize later on in the show as well as taking your questions. Uh, But for now, let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, obviously... Um, we've been talking about this a lot, but in terms of the ways that uh, you know organizations have been adjusting, not just to COVID-19, but also kind of the ensuing uh, changes in business and how we're kind of shifting into the near future, you know, that's been a big disruption for a lot of IT organizations everywhere. Uh, Chidera, can you start and just tell us a little bit from your perspective with the customers you deal with, I think particularly in the Microsoft space, What have been some of the biggest changes and challenges that you've seen out of the customers that you talk to? Yeah, uh, definitely, Justin. Uh, The primary change I've seen this year is a shift in mindset from both providers and consumers. As a sysadmin, your job requirements were changed nearly overnight, requiring you to quickly (laughs) learn new skills and, you know, study new solutions to help your organization maintain some measure of productivity as your business weathered the effects of the pandemic. This engendered a different way of thinking, with divergence approaches being implemented to solve the problem of quickly facilitating and securing a remote workforce. The pivot to what has been termed as the modern workplace has brought with it an increase in attack surfaces, which has overwhelmed cybersecurity resources, thereby resulting in overworked sysadmins. To combat this trend of overworked sysadmins and to close some of the gaps that were introduced by the move to remote work, companies like Microsoft have built comprehensive threat intelligence solutions that detect attacks as they occur in real time automate threat response, and enable powerful reconnaissance tools to incident response teams. 
It stands to reason that new challenges sometimes need new solutions, and the solutions we'll be reviewing today are meant to integrate across people, devices, apps, and data. It is this same commitment to integration that makes Microsoft 365 security and compliance solutions a leader in the cybersecurity space. Equally as important, these solutions will ensure a frictionless user experience so your end users continue to excel in their jobs. And with these changes also uh, came a big shift in the way that we communicate and collaborate with each other. Um, now that the, the safety net, if you will, of being able to walk up to your coworkers and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I really need you to respond to that email, or I really need you to answer this question for me so that you know me or my team can continue doing our tasks. Uh, now that that has been taken away, the importance of being able to communicate uh, efficiently has, has gone up quite a bit. Um, and it, when you're not all sharing the same space and you don't have the luxury of, you know, physically seeing the people that you need to communicate with, uh, it, it becomes a lot harder to be efficient as a company. And the larger your company is, the more uh, teams that you have, the harder it becomes. So um, miscommunication and, and you know, doubling work or being inefficient is a, a compounding problem. And the more it happens, the more problems it creates and so on and so forth. So uh, that's something that I think a lot of companies should really focus on is getting the communication and collaboration uh, aspect down as it impacts almost everything else in your company. Um, and in addition to that, the, the, the mass migration, if you will, to uh, remote infrastructure, it, as Chidera touched on, it really, uh, for a lot of sysadmins, it kind of like doubled their workload overnight because now you have to not only learn a new system, but you have to create the infrastructure and you have to train the users and uh, you have to really kind of like overhaul your entire way of thinking now that this is uh, where the shift is going. So um, uh, I'm sure a, a lot of the sysadmins out there uh, will definitely agree that, that the shift was kind of a, a big turning point and it's something that's not going away. So it, it's something that you will have to just learn to, um, to be proficient with in the future. True. And, uh, you know, to circle back, uh, let's not forget security. <laughs> uh, in the past, the practice of allowing bring your own devices or, you know, BYOD devices uh, was affected by which attackers could access your network uninhibited. And with these devices flooding corporate resources, bad actors had more cover with which to entrench themselves within an organization's network. Uh, work from home meant these devices didn't have an intelligent firewall for protection or means by which to verify that the software-based firewalls on said devices were not disabled. To that end, we will be delving into how emerging cybersecurity practices like the zero trust model uh, should be leveraged to combat anonymous behavior in your environment. All right. Um, you know, let's talk next about how this is impacting IT pros individually, right? So obviously starting a career um, in IT at this moment is definitely a lot different than it was, <laughs> you know, even five years ago, even one year ago. Um, you know, what advice do you guys have for anyone who's starting out brand new or even anyone who's just trying to like kind of beef up their IT resume at this point? Chidera, let's start with you. Yeah, great question, Justin. Uh, so. I would recommend getting acquainted with cloud technologies, such as Microsoft 365 and Azure. I know that sounds pretty obvious, uh, but that is a great starting point. Looking into the differences between hosted and on-prem solutions, uh, that is also a great place uh, to sort of start from uh, because it really allows you to use what you already know uh, from on-prem solutions and uh, relate that to concepts that are found uh, in cloud solutions because many of the concepts are actually very similar, uh, such as spinning up a virtual machine in VMware versus spinning it up in Azure. Uh, the principles still hold true. It's just in a different setting, uh, in a different uh, company's organization's infrastructure. And then along with that, hosting infrastructure fully in the cloud both server and workstation. So sort of getting hands-on and practicing with that, uh, with that idea. Uh, to help establish that baseline understanding of cloud technologies, we've actually included a diagram in the sidebar that provides a great analogy between the major types of cloud-hosted solutions and pizza. <laughs> in short, uh, SaaS or software 
as a service is software that is available via a third party uh, over the internet. Some common examples include Office 365, desktop apps, and web apps, uh, Apple's iCloud, and Dropbox. Whereas Platform as a Service, or PaaS, uh, is hardware and software tools that are made available over the internet by a cloud provider. Uh, examples include Managed SQL Database, Azure Active Directory, and Windows Virtual Desktop. And lastly, we have Infrastructure as a Service. And you know this is a cloud-based service, as you'd imagine, uh, which often has a sort of pay-as-you-go uh, style of payment. Uh, so this is uh, OpEx versus CapEx. And with that, some examples include Azure Virtual Machines, uh, Amazon Web Services, EC2 instances, and Google Compute Engine. Cloud file shares uh, are also a little bit different uh, versus on-prem solutions uh, in that they're easier to access, such as SharePoint Online, OneDrive for personal uh, consumer use and OneDrive for business for the uh, business client and Azure Files. Uh, it really makes uh, the method by which you're able to access those files uh, much more seamless. And along with that, it introduces cloud authentication. Instead of an on-prem authentication process, cloud authentication greatly simplifies the login experience for end users, uh, thereby reducing administrative overhead and also cutting down on IT spend uh, with solutions such as multi-factor authentication with Azure AD, conditional access policies, and single sign-on. It makes the process by which your end users are able to authenticate and authorize themselves much easier and reduces the number of help desk I'm sorry, help desk tickets that you as an admin have to deal with. Sorry. Um, Mike, what about you? So uh, to touch on what Chidera said, uh, I, I used to hear from a lot of sysadmins when this whole work from home uh, shift started that they it was kind of overwhelming to try and learn you know Azure or AWS or mm -hmm. Citrix in, in in that short amount of time, and they kind of felt like you know I'm already so proficient in Hyper V and VMware and Citrix that it, it feels like it. I'm losing so much by moving to a brand new infrastructure, but there's a lot more similarities between them than I think most people can kind of see. Um, moving from something like Hyper-V to Azure isn't like going from the trumpet to the violin. It's more like going from the violin to the, the cello, where, yeah, there's some differences, but if you're proficient at one, you already have a lot of the skill set that you need to be proficient at the other. It just takes a little time to get acquainted with the new you know, interfaces and and small differences here and there. But in terms of like similarities, a lot of the design infrastructure is the same. Like networking works the same way. You control it through firewall and NAT rules and things like that. The interface might be different, but as long as you know how to, you know, create a set of firewall rules, you can do the same in Azure. Uh, building a VM is largely the same. You select the, you know, the image it comes from, you select the hardware and off you go. Um, and, but there are also differences, and I think these are very good differences, um, such as being able to administer from anywhere that you have a computer and internet connection and an internet browser. There's no, nothing special you need to log on to Azure and administer any part of your network. You could be in any part of the world, and as long as you have a decent internet connection, it's like you are on-prem and you're able to control everything. Um, there's also a lot less chance of, like, catastrophic failure, right? With an on-prem server, it, someone spills a water bottle or there's a leak or it gets really humid and air conditioning fails and your entire server stack goes down. When you have your infrastructure hosted with something like Azure, the chances of one of their data centers burning down or blowing up or something like that is, is very low. Um, so you shift a lot of the responsibility over to Microsoft, which is kind of a nice feeling because you don't have to worry about any of that. And uh, even in the case of catastrophic, catastrophic failure, uh, being hosted in the cloud makes it all easier to back up and have a disaster recovery in place. Um, and again, you're handing off that responsibility to Microsoft, so it's less for you to worry about. As long as you set it up correctly, um, it, from what I've seen, it works very, very well. So my biggest piece of advice is to not approach having to work with new platforms as a burden. Um, think of it as a chance to take all of the skills that you already have and being able to transition them to a new platform, which is you know, a great way to learn, a great way to familiarize yourself with something that's going to be around for a long time to come. All right. 
Um, let's talk next about the actual devices. Uh, Janelle, let's start with you. So in terms of things like Intune and mobile device management, um, this is going to be something new for a lot of IT organizations. A lot of folks are just kind of concerned about um, you know, securing the data in the cloud um, and providing access. But in terms of actually securing the devices, um, can you talk us through what Intune is and how it kind of plays into this new era uh, of remote administration? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so to kick, kick things off, uh, Intune has actually uh, undergone a recent name change. Uh, it's been changed from Intune, of course, right, uh, to Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Now, I suppose that makes it a little bit easier to understand what it's meant to do, uh, but seeing as so many uh, users were already acquainted with Intune, uh, it does seem sort of uh, a bit too late to be changing that, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, what I would like to do though, is to conduct a quick demonstration. Uh, so to that end, let me go ahead and quickly share one of my screens here with you guys. Yep. My admin center. Are you able to see that clearly? Yeah, we can see it. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so. Uh, along with the change uh, to the naming of Intune to Microsoft Endpoint Manager, uh, we also have a, another way, a new way with which we can access the Admin Center for Endpoint Manager, which is actually found within the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Uh, so if we were to go ahead and click on Endpoint Manager, that would open up a new tab for us. And in here, uh, as you can see, uh, we have a few dashboards. Uh, these dashboards are meant to give you uh, some quick insights into the uh, health status of your Intune deployment, uh, your devices that you deployed, device compliance, uh, metrics, and things of that nature. But let's go ahead and take a quick look into devices here. And I just quickly want to show how easy it is to uh, enroll devices. You actually have an automatic enrollment option for Windows 10 devices, right? It doesn't get much easier than this. Uh, essentially, any device that is either Azure AD joined or Azure AD registered uh, can be automatically triggered for enrollment into Intune. And then you can also narrow down the scope for the MDM uh, enrollment. MDM stands for Mobile Device Management. You can reduce it to some and then include any user groups or device groups uh, that you would like to have enrolled. And along that side, you also have MAM user scope. And the MAM user scope is for mobile app management. Uh, the difference between mobile app management and mobile device management is that the mobile app management focuses entirely on the apps and data that is relevant to your organization. So essentially your organization's intellectual property while excluding any apps or data that are uh, owned by the end user. So in this way, you're able to create a segmentation uh, between data that is important for your company to secure uh, versus data that is uh, important for the end user to retain. Uh, so this is really useful for, uh, again, bring your own device environment uh, where users are bringing their own cell phones that they then use to access company data, such as uh, uh, Exchange Online, for instance. Uh, this would be very helpful for securing that data without impacting negatively impacting end user data. So let's go ahead and jump back into devices real quick. And the other thing I want to briefly touch on uh, are compliance policies. Now, the way to look at compliance policies is really that they are rules that you define as an admin, rules and settings that users and devices must adhere to in order to be uh, seen as compliant by Azure AD. And then that also pertains to uh, policies that you can trigger based on that device's compliance. Uh, so for instance, uh, we can go ahead and uh, take a quick look at this uh, MDM compliance policy for iOS devices. Again, just quickly going through this. <laughs> and uh, we can see sort of the requirements uh, that we've set forth. Uh, so device cannot be jailbroken. Right, so we don't want any iOS devices uh, that are jailbroken uh, in our environment. Uh, based on this, we can then restrict access to uh, various resources like Exchange Online or SharePoint Online, uh, depending on what we, what level of risk we as organization are willing to take per the device's uh, lack of compliance. And then also we can require uh, password a password to unlock the device. So this would be you know, the pin code that you have to enter in order to gain access to the device. So again, this just further secures the device with that compliance policy. 
And then we can set minimum password lengths uh, and also uh, the required password type has to be numerical. Uh, so this would be a pin code uh, versus using a uh, uh, alphabet or alphabet password. Uh, so let's jump back into devices here. And then let's also quickly take a look at configuration profiles. Now, configuration profiles are actual uh, features and settings that Intune will apply on the device. So whereas compliance uh, settings are, I'm sorry, whereas compliance policies are meant to investigate the device and make sure that it has those settings and then apply a compliance metric based on that, the actual Configuration of devices done through configuration profiles. And again, here we have one for iOS devices uh, to restrict the game center. We can quickly take a look at the properties here. And we can see the group that is targeting our sales and marketing uh, group. And if we go to edit, we can quickly see what settings are configured here. And not to spend too much time, uh, but you can essentially see what settings you can configure uh, require Intune store password for all purchases. So, you know, you can't just have, let's say, a, a, uh, a user in your organization who happens to have kids that they, you know, share the device to. You can't just have uh, the kids installing things on the device without the uh, parent's uh, knowledge. So, again, just making sure that you secure those devices appropriately. And then from there, uh, what I would also like to uh, quickly show you here, uh, it's the group policy analytics, which is currently in preview. And what this helps you do is to take your existing group policy objects that are in your on-prem Active Directory, uh, import it into uh, mobile, uh, the mobile endpoint manager console here. And then from there, uh, the mobile endpoint management console will actually show you which group policies uh, align to the MDM scopes, uh, whether or not it's going to be supported and, you know, sort of how it's going to work within uh, the mobile uh, device management section. So very powerful tool to use, uh, really cuts down on the administrative headache of uh, manually searching on Google, looking for, you know, oh, will this group policy work uh, in Microsoft's endpoint management tool? And what I did also want to show uh, are conditional access policies. And the reason being uh, the compliance policies that we require with mobile endpoint management can actually trigger conditional access policies. Here we have one called Exchange Online Requires Compliant Device. And what this effectively means is that in order for a device to gain access to our Exchange Online environment, that device needs to be marked as compliant by Intune. So again, it all goes back to that integration uh, between the various solutions uh, that Microsoft 365 offers. And you know, to quickly recap here, as I conclude my screen share session, uh, fortunately this was, oh, yeah, there we go, finally loaded. I <laughs> just wanted to quickly <laughs> show you the requirements, the required device to be marked as compliant, and that grants the device access. Uh, but yes, to quickly recap, uh, the security justifications for Intune, again, come down to your ability to configure the device to meet certain security requirements, and then to also enforce compliance requirements uh, on those devices uh, per your you know, regulatory compliances that your organization has, or just, you know, general policies that your company needs to adhere to. And uh, again, that feeds into the whole compliance justification as well. And also with mobile app management policies uh, or mobile app management scoping, uh, you're able to uh, afford your end users a level of freedom uh, for their BYOD devices while still maintaining uh, the security of your organization. And really that facilitates end user uh, onboarding and device deployment as well. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it back to you there, Justin. Let me just uh, oh. go ahead and end the screen share and you can now uh, let me know if all looks yeah. well on your end. We got everyone back. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, Mike, let's go to you for this next question. Obviously, as folks are remote, 
um, we don't have that in-person collaboration that I think a lot of folks are used to, you know, jumping up to a whiteboard and, uh, being able to just kind of scribble things down. It does make things a little bit more complicated. I can't just swing by somebody's desk on a whim to kind of, you know, talk about an idea. Um, what can you tell us about how Microsoft is, is trying to help enable this for remote workers? I think, you know, especially when you're talking about tools like Microsoft Teams, um, what should folks know about it other than just it's a way to chat and send emojis to people? Yeah, absolutely. So unless you've been living under a rock for the past couple of years, I'm sure Microsoft has reached out to you at least once, sent you an email or something about, you know, new features in Teams or why you should switch. Or even if you've been living under a rock, I'm sure Microsoft would have found some way to tell you. Uh, but it, as I'm sure you guys are are probably tired of hearing about Microsoft Teams, but there has been a lot of updates and changes that really do make it a great way for teams to collaborate even remotely. And with the with the huge shift that came, uh, Microsoft kind of realized that, hey, this is really important. And they put a lot of focus into making Teams uh, more than just a chat tool, right? And some of the benefits are, one of the biggest ones that I see is the easy integration with Office 365. Um, I'm sure if you have Teams, you probably have other Office 365 offerings. So being able to connect the two easily is, uh, I think, a, a, a really great thing because it cuts down a lot of you know administrative work and things like that. So integrating with your Azure AD, integrating with your O365, with your SharePoint, and so on and so forth really makes it uh, like a central uh, app that you can use for a lot of things. Um, you also have multi-device capabilities. You can use it on your phone, your laptop, your uh, your desktop, even your smart TV <laughs> if you wanted to. Um, and this allows you to, you know, uh, use the same app no matter where you are. If you're in the if you're traveling, you're in the car in your hotel, uh, you can go on your phone, your laptop. If you're at home, you can go on your desktop. So, uh, being able to use it across a multitude of devices really makes it a lot easier on the end user. Um, breakout rooms uh, in the chats are also a really nice feature because there's a lot of times when you have a big meeting and there's 20 people, uh, but then five of them need to talk about something that doesn't include the other 20. Uh, and you don't want to just have those five people talk in the room and exclude the other 15 and it's just a waste of time. So you can do breakout rooms where uh, these side conversations can happen on their own without disrupting the, the bigger picture. Um, there's also a really cool tool that that uh, I personally am a huge fan of, which is live transcriptions during Teams meetings. And uh, live transcriptions are a hard thing to get down, but from what I've seen so far, from what I've used, it's actually really nice. Um, and it really helps for people that you know are either hearing impaired or just prefer to read instead of listen. Um, and in addition to that, you can also record the entire meeting and it'll have a transcript uh, of it as well. And these will automatically get uploaded to the meeting room after your meeting is done. So you can share it out with everyone that was in there and you can, uh, you know, go back to it whenever you want. And it, aside from all of these uh, features that I talked about, there are quite a few apps that you can download. So if there's anything that teams can't natively do, you can find an app for it and install it and try it out and add these to your teams, add these to your chats and just play around with it. And it's infinitely customizable. And you can find a set of apps that will do what you need to and you can set it however you like. So with all of these features, it's uh, Teams is, uh, like I said, a very central app where you can you can do so many things on. You can chat, you can have meetings, you can have these apps, you can share files, you can you know separate uh, teams into uh, more efficient, smaller silos, um, and it, it it's really nice to be able to to go to one app and just see uh, like your your schedule for the day, any chats you need to respond to, any meetings that you have set up, and uh, I highly recommend that uh, if you haven't given Teams a try, uh, to just try it out, play around with it, and customize it to your liking. And I think that you'll find that it will be a very valuable tool. All right, sounds great. All right, one of the last things that I do want to talk about before we jump into the questions from the audience um, is around the clients, right? So the computer kind. Mm -hmm. um, so with everybody now working from home for a lot of organizations, 
Um, that's a big gap now in terms of level of control and security that you would typically get in an office environment where everyone's located together. Things like firewalls and domain policies. Mike, let's start with you. What is some advice that you have in terms of being able to replicate this level of you know granularity um, in an environment where you cannot physically reach out and touch people and they are kind of on utilizing their own individual home networks? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, having a remote uh, workspace, is, especially now, I think is a, is a very big boon to your business. Um, and I'm actually going to do a screen share real quick and go over Windows Virtual Desktop and kind of show you guys a, a very quick overview of, of how it works and, and how much easier it is than a traditional kind of TS environment. Uh, so let me know when you can see my screen here. I can see it. Okay. Yep, looks good. Perfect. All right. So this is the Windows Virtual Desktop app inside of Azure. And there's three main components to creating a, uh, an environment, the first of which is a host pool. And you can think of a, of a host pool as a collection of VMs. This would be analogous to a TS server farm or a Citrix farm in a on-prem environment. And you can create as many pools as you want. Uh, and you can specialize them uh, depending on what you want. So for example, pool 01 could be your general desktop. Uh, pool, uh, pool 02 could be like for high performance users that need a lot more RAM and, and, and performance out of the machines and so on and so forth. Application groups are groups of uh, applications that the users have access to. For example, application group one could be a full desktop. Application group two could be a remote app um, for, you know, like HR or uh, sales or something like that, where they only need access to an app and not a full desktop. And you can have as many of these groups as you want and customize it to your liking. And the last component of this is the workspace. And a workspace is a group of application groups. So for example, workspace one could be for human resources people. And in their application group, they have a full desktop and they have a HR specific remote app. So uh, when an HR user logs on, they would see those resources allocated to them. So let me give you a quick rundown of how a user would connect to this uh, Windows Virtual Desktop environment after you set it up. And in a traditional TS kind of environment, they would have to use something like a remote desktop and they would, you know, most of the time they would have to VPN in. Sometimes they have to put a proxy uh, gateway. And the less things that you need your users to do, I think everyone will agree with me here, if the better for you uh, and your sanity and your free time and, and all of that. So uh, with Windows Remote, Desk, uh, with Microsoft Remote Desktop, uh, the only thing your users need to do is one, download this app. It'll have this icon here called Windows Remote Desktop. You can find it on the, um, on the Microsoft Store. It's also available for Macs. And number two, all they need to remember is their username and password. So I've got this uh, app opened up. And the first thing you need to do is click subscribe. And over here, they will enter their login information. And once that is entered correctly, give it a moment. And now you see that I have my workspace that contains these two resources. I'm going to go ahead and connect to my virtual desktop. You'll see a pop up in just a moment here. This will come up. While, while I wait for that, actually, I'm going to show you the other part, which is the insights portion. Now, every uh, virtual Windows virtual desktop environment you have, you have this insights. Um, and this gives you a central place to monitor your environment and make sure that everything is going OK. If users start complaining about connection issues, you can go here and you can see how many users and what users are having connection issues. Now, this right here is going to be pretty blank because this is just a test environment for us, but you can see the depth of what kind of metrics and measures. Right? So you have all of these statistics. And you also have, uh, you can also uh, drill down into what kind of statistic, statistics you want to see up here by going to any of these tabs. 
So this makes it really easy to, uh, to log in and just kind of get a broad overview. Whereas in a traditional TS kind of farm, you have to go through the event viewer and that's kind of a tedious process. And this really streamlines it a lot and makes it a lot easier to you know, administer and monitor your environment. So here is my virtual desktop. Uh, and yeah, uh, all the user needed to do was, uh, uh, sorry, there's three steps. Download the app, enter your username and password, and then insult the Windows Virtual Desktop app a little bit until it lets you connect. So there we are. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share there. Uh, but Windows Virtual Desktop is something that has undergone a lot of changes. Uh, the first time that I played around with it, uh, about a year ago, you had to create the entire thing from a PowerShell. Uh, you have to enter a lot of commands, you have to write down the tenant IDs, and so it, they've improved it quite a bit. And I highly recommend anyone that needs a remote environment to check it out and play around with it and create a test environment to start off. Cool. Um, Chidera, let's go to you next. Obviously, you know, mm -hmm. Having that level of remote access is awesome from a user experience and from an administrative yeah. perspective in terms of maintenance, but from a security perspective, should we be concerned? What, what should we know about how to approach this? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, really security um, or concern comes part and parcel with security. Uh, this topic really goes back to our earlier conversation uh, about the shift in mindset for organizations that have or are in the process of transitioning to the cloud. The sudden pivot to the cloud that was necessitated by the pandemic has led to many organizations foregoing security in favor of ease of access and minimal downtime. Cybersecurity should never come as an afterthought, just as you wouldn't build a bridge with safety as a perk to be added at some unspecified time. Uh, until now, there has been an over-reliance on cybersecurity insurance by businesses who, businesses who would rather risk paying ransoms to cyber criminals uh, instead of paying the much smaller cost for the right security measures right now. <laughs> Even insurance companies are beginning to feel the strain on their seemingly bottomless coffers that this backwards mentality has brought about. And they're starting to explore policies that will exclude businesses from collecting on their cybersecurity related claims. Building IT solutions right means building them with security from the ground up. Along those lines, a growing philosophy in cybersecurity is that of zero trust. As described by Microsoft, zero trust is both a journey and a foundation to a secure remote work force. The prevailing thought within the zero trust met methodology is that you should assume that your environment has already been breached. And as such, you should configure your systems in such a way that all facets of your domain are required to authenticate and authorize based on all available data points. We have dropped a link to a guide to building resilience into the sidebar for your review. Among other things, this guide will help you assess how your environment could be improved by implementing the zero trust model. Uh, user productivity does not need to come at the expense of maintaining sensible security measures and regulatory compliance requirements. I have to stress that VPNs are not enough to secure your environment. Traditional VPNs were not designed to scale to handle the level or rather the amount of bandwidth that is required by having a 100% remote workforce. Routing all traffic through a VPN slows productivity in and incentivizes users to bypass security. For organizations that still have on-prem resources that their users need to access, a combination of split tunneling and cloud-native security tools would provide a stronger level of security while also maintaining end-user productivity. Microsoft Defender products provide cloud-based intrusion prevention, detection, and remediation. Microsoft Cloud Security provides governance of data in Microsoft 365, Azure, and third-party apps. And Azure Active Directory secures access to user identities, data, apps, and, de and devices protecting your front door. All right, very cool. And one last question before we go to our audience questions. Uh, where does Trusted Tech play into all this? How do you guys help out organizations that are looking to be able to implement some of the solutions that we've been talking about today? Yeah. Uh, so for those of you that have attended video meetups uh, with us before, you might know what's coming. Uh, at Trusted Tech Team, <laughs> we're committed to helping organizations leverage Microsoft 365 and Azure to 
uh, their fullest. For registrations or registrants of this BMU, we are offering a promotion. Uh, if your organization is already consuming Azure or Microsoft 365, we will award you a $50 Amazon gift card to meet with us uh, to see if we would be a good fit to assist you in managing your Microsoft 365 and Azure resources. Uh, there are a few stipulations, but all of those details are linked in the sidebar. Uh, if you sign up for a time slot, make sure to mention any questions you might have. Uh, that way, one of us, myself or Michael, uh, will be there to help out. Yep. Sounds good. Michael, anything that you'd add? Uh, no, Chidera pretty much covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sounds good. All right. We got a ton of questions. Uh, thanks to everyone who submitted yeah. them. Try to get through as many as we can. Um, we'll start with Jay Calber. Um, wants to know what cloud solution would you recommend for a small company, 30 to 50 employees that does not have on-prem server for users to authenticate? We're currently using, whoop, slip down, uh, SharePoint 365 and OneDrive instead of an on, a traditional on-prem file server. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I definitely think that, uh, here we are, uh, I definitely think that Azure, uh, bringing your infrastructure over to Azure for a company of that size is probably your best bet. Um, so it, when you don't have any on-premise servers, you can use Azure AD uh, for the authentication and, uh, you know, you can still utilize SharePoint and OneDrive uh, and that will, uh, you know, integrate with Azure AD very well. And then, you know, you can also add Teams into the mix, which I highly recommend, which integrates with both of those other things. Um, so uh, from my personal experience, uh, companies of this size, 30 to 50 people are, are a, a very good fit for Azure. Uh, and I think it scales very well from there. Uh, and if your company does grow, which I think is always a, a thing to look forward to, uh, scaling up in Azure is, is incredibly easy compared to on-prem. You don't need to buy any new equipment. All you have to do is go in and change a few settings and redeploy some machines, um, and, and you're set to go. Yeah, right. definitely. Awesome. And to, to just quickly add to that as well, um, it, it sounds as though this organization is already using SharePoint, but possibly looking into using another cloud solution, uh, rather cloud store solution. Uh, if that's the case, I would be curious to know where SharePoint might be lacking in terms of its uh, its its access to files or uh, perhaps its storage. Uh, one thing to bear in mind: uh, you are able to increase your SharePoint online storage as well. Uh, that's an issue that many organizations that we've worked with have run into uh, or rather have encountered in that uh, they have a certain number of users licensed for SharePoint, but that number of users that are licensed for SharePoint isn't enough to provide the amount of storage that they require. So what you can do is to actually purchase an add-on license, uh, which increases your Office 365 uh, storage capacity uh, without you needing to, to pay for a full-blown SharePoint online license. So uh, that might be worth considering if that happens to be uh, because of uh, the search for another file uh, storage solution. Okay. All right. Uh, got a question from Just Right IT, and uh, it's a licensing question. I know you guys are super excited about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to know what, what, what licensing level do we need to have to get access to MDM compliance? Is MDM compliance available at the M365 Business Basic license level? Yeah, so um, great question. So certain parts of the mobile, the Microsoft endpoint management are made available at the lower Microsoft 365 business tiers. What I will say, though, is for most organizations, either or rather for most organizations, the Microsoft 365 business premium license would be the best approach because it it includes all the features that are available with Microsoft Endpoint Management, uh, in addition to, of course, the Office 365 productivity apps as well. Um, so what I mean to say is using that and with the addition of, or with the fact that the Microsoft 365 Business Premium License includes Azure Active Directory Premium P1, which is really what makes uh, mobile device management compliance policies uh, the most impactful, I would say that would be the best approach from a licensing point of view. Uh, again, this is assuming your organization is um, less than 300 or so users. All right. Um, let's take a question from Dave VDM. Um, do we have a way of testing policies before enforcing them, especially in a distributed IT environment? 
Who wants to take that one? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, depends on what policies uh, you're referring to. So if we are referring to conditional access policies, there's actually a tool within the conditional access uh, control panel uh, that is called the what if tool. And very similar to uh, the PowerShell what if command, uh, you're able to use that to uh, see what would occur for any conditional access policies that you've applied to a particular user or a group of users. Uh, so that's on the conditional access side. For mobile device management though, the best way to really test out policies would be to create a pilot group. Uh, and that pilot group would then uh, be used to test out any uh, configuration profiles or compliance uh, policies that you would use on your users and devices. Uh, the reason being, you actually need to apply the policies to the devices to really know what would happen. Uh, but again, there's the what if tool for conditional access policies. And then there is my recommendation of using a pilot group of about five to 10 users, depending on the size of your organization for the actual mobile device management policies. Okay. Um, let's take a question from S. Turner. Uh, how do you manage Mac updates with an endpoint mm -hmm. manager? Yeah, yeah. So um, there are there are certain capabilities within Microsoft Endpoint Manager whereby you are able to. How should I put it? So, yeah, for so first of all, Microsoft Endpoint Manager supports Mac OS devices, right? And it also supports iOS devices. Now, as far as uh, managing updates of those uh, Mac OS devices, there, from the last I checked, that is not yet included, but I do believe Microsoft is working on uh, enabling that solution. Um, so I would say definitely, you know, continue to check back to see if Microsoft Import Management uh, ends up providing that capability for Mac OS devices, uh, but. As of now, I'd have to say it's not an option. But what I would like to do is I'm going to take this question back with me, and I'm going to do a little bit more digging. Uh, I do have to be honest. I don't manage Mac OS devices very often. So there very well may be a solution out there, and I don't want to just say no outright because very often there's either a solution or there's a workaround. So I will be taking this question back and uh, addressing it via email, if that's all right with you. All right, no worries. Yeah. Um, let's get a question. This one from T. Roberts too. Are there specific Azure licenses or tiers for virtual desktops? Yeah. So um, for uh, for creating a Windows virtual desktop environment, um, for creating any resource in Azure, actually, you don't need an Office 365 license uh, because Azure is a purely cost based. Uh, subscription type of model. So uh, you can spin up as many resources as you want and you're paying per usage. So if you have a Windows virtual desktop environment with uh, 10 computers that are running four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, uh, it's gonna cost uh, more than if you're running a Windows virtual desktop environment with five desktops and, and two eight, uh, right? So um, there, you don't need any licenses to make this work. Uh, but you do want to, I would recommend setting up the Azure AD uh, to make it easier for your users and to make it easier for you to group things. Uh, but yeah, as far as requirements, uh, there really is none. You just need uh, Azure. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of questions, I'm trying to get through all of them. Boss Clark wants to know, we are using on-premise Active Directory and GPO. What is the transition path to using Endpoint Manager to manage remote PCs? Great question. Um, so the, the transition path would actually be to use the group policy analytics, um, which I briefly touched on uh, during my demonstration. Uh, the reason being, you would again be able to import the on-premise group policy objects that you have with your on-premise Active Directory, and then from there, uh, gain an understanding of which GPOs can be replicated in Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And then for any GPOs that might not be replicable within Microsoft Endpoint Management, uh, you would then, as an organization, need to decide, are these GPOs that are actually 
required, especially with the transition to uh, cloud solutions. Uh, a lot of GPOs are created with the intention of managing an on-prem infrastructure and really don't need to be recreated when you do make that shift to cloud infrastructures. So those are some considerations to have, and that would be the starting point. Again, using the group policy analytics to determine if your GPOs can actually be uh, transferred as they are, and if not, from there deciding, are these GPOs that are required post uh, post transition or post migration, so to speak. Cool. All right. Um, this is a good question from LLC DSI. Can you talk about the amount of resources, aka processor RAM, that are allocated for Windows virtual desktop resource pools? In other words, how many modestly provisioned virtualized desktops can you deploy within a standard O365 subscription when you're managing about 100 users in your tenant? Yeah. So um, as I said before, uh, there is a, the if you want to spin up a Windows virtual desktop environment, it's not tied to any O365 license. Uh, it's a purely pay as you go model. Uh, so you only pay for what you spin up and what you use. Um, and it, the, the types of resources that you want to allocate to it, it's very much uh, they have Azure has a bunch of sizes going from one core and two gigs of, of RAM up to something like 64 cores and, and 256 gigs of RAM. So there's a size that will fit for whatever you need it to. And if you're talking specifically about Windows Virtual Desktop, each pool that you have, every uh, session host inside of the same pool has to be the same size. But you can have multiple different pools with multiple different configurations for the VMs. So one pool for general use, one pool for high performance, one pool for maybe something in low performance where they just need to check their email or do word processing. So uh, for, for a company with about 100 users, uh, I would say probably three or four uh, host pools is what I usually see in a company of that size. Um, but you can allocate resources within those pools and to each session host as you see fit. You can also change them uh, uh, down the line. Uh, but keep in mind that if you change it within an application, uh, uh, with uh, sorry, within a host pool, you have to change it for all the VMs inside of there. All right. Um, and let's take a couple more. I've got a question from Phil. We don't have a server and need to lock down all endpoint devices to run only whitelisted applications natively on each device. Will Azure Cloud prevent the running of applications in this way? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, so um, really where this comes, what this comes down to would be a combination of using Microsoft Endpoint Management to deploy those apps uh, that are um, sanctioned or allowed, and then also using Microsoft Cloud App Security uh, to mark any apps that are detected as uh, being unsanctioned, or how should I say, any apps that are detected as being unsanctioned and marking them uh, appropriately. And then with the compliance that's triggered from that, you can then uh, enable conditional access policies that again uh, relay, relate back to the compliance metrics of that device and prevent the user from accessing data if uh, those non-compliant apps are discovered. Uh, in this case, um, it would be unprotected apps, uh, I believe would be the term within mobile. I'm sorry, I keep going back to mobile. Microsoft Endpoint <laughs> Manager. <laughs> All right, and uh, let's take one last question. This is from Kretsch PDX. Do you recommend any online resources for creating and updating robust BIOD policies? Hmm. Hmm. Or where would you recommend starting, if nothing else? Okay, great question. Okay, so where I would recommend starting is actually one of the um, documents or links that we included in the sidebar, and that would be the uh, security, a guide for build, to building resilience. Uh, that guide actually includes links to Microsoft tools that help with that exact sort of um, requirement, uh, building, um, you know, building the appropriate policies within Microsoft Endpoint Manager, building the appropriate policies within Microsoft Cloud Security, uh, leveraging Azure Active Directory, and things of that nature to ultimately reach a uh, zero trust uh, and maintain a zero trust methodology within your organization. So again, the 
third document that's uh, included in our sidebar, if it's in the same order that I recall it being in, uh, which is entitled Security colon, A Guide to Building Resilience. I would start from there. Also, uh, real quickly, just kind of to add on, uh, this question from, from Dave EDM kind of touches on the same thing. Uh, are there any network labs or training resources we can use to get geared up on WVD? Um, so with Azure, you have, uh, you have a free trial uh, with $200 for you to kind of play around with. And I think that's uh, getting hands-on experience with building one and testing it out, I think is the absolute best way to do that. Um, if you do want to, want to start a brand new Azure account and kind of play around with it and you like, um, you know, someone looking over your shoulder and kind of telling you what to do here and there or answer your questions as they come up, I highly recommend starting in the Azure subscription with us. You'll get uh, access to Premier support. Um, and when you are ready to start building, uh, I'd be happy to jump on with you, do a remote session, and we can go through it together and I can answer any questions you have in the moment as well. All right. Well, uh, there you have it. We are about out of time. I uh, want to thank all everyone for uh, asking all those wonderful questions. Um, it's now time to announce the winner of our prize. And so the winner of the Amazon gift card is going to go to Crutch PBX. Congratulations, Crutch ah, PBX. You are the oh, winner nice. of our Congrats. Amazon gift card. Hope you spend it on something good. Congratulations. Um, as always, whenever we give away an Amazon gift card, I highly recommend spending it on yourself. You're the one that sat <laughs> yes. in the presentation. You asked the questions. <laughs> sure. Wasn't your family members. <laughs> you did all the hard it work. It's you. Hope <laughs> you spend it on something good. Let us know how you Thank like you. it. Um, <laughs> big thank you to Chidera and Mike, uh, as well as the Trusted Tech team for sponsoring today's event. Hope we get a chance to do it's this. I'm sure we'll be back sometime soon. Looking forward yeah. to the next one already. <laughs> um, for Absolutely. more shows just like this, we hope to see you guys around. Um, please click on the click here for upcoming shows button or by sticking around until after the presentation ends. But until then, please stay safe. Keep it spicy. We'll see you all back here next time. So long, everybody. <laughs>